Jesus meets people exactly where they are. I'm going to open with that today. Jesus meets people anywhere, anytime, under any conditions of their life. Jesus is meeting you right where you are watching us online at FAM TV today. Wednesday night, on our Wednesday night Bible study, we shared Ephesians 1 in verse 8, where it says that God abounds toward us. And the word abound there means that God runs toward us with his arms full of all the blessings that we are going to need in our lives. It says that he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, when did he give it to us? As he abounded toward us, okay? God finds us anywhere we are, under any condition of life, he is running toward you. Today I want to share a message with you called this. Landfill to Lord filled. Landfill to Lord filled. And our staff is excited about this today because I preached this message to them on Thursday. That's our practice day when we do our run-throughs. And so they know what's coming, all right? Landfill to Lord filled. Jesus is not drawn to people whose lives are perfectly put together. Can I get a thank God? Because who, whose life really is perfectly put together in every aspect? Jesus is drawn to the opposite. People who are not perfect. People just like you and me. In fact, it seems that Jesus picks the really messed up people to do some of the biggest things for him. I look at the Apostle Paul, whose job it was to be an enforcer. He enforced the law. I mean, and he went beyond breaking kneecaps. Uh, he had people killed for breaking the laws. Yet, God used a man like that to write three quarters of the New Testament. I want to show you a story today. It's the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And I know that this is kind of a heavy story to be our first service back to church. And, and, and we would really like it to be like fun and cheery and airy. But um, I don't think a lot of us feel that way anyway. <laughs> it, I, we, we've noticed over the last few weeks that our services are kind of a little bit more serious. And like to the point and people are going home. We're not really sure how to do church yet this new way, but I didn't get to preach on Easter, we lost Easter service, and I really think that this message is going to be impactful if you just stick with me, okay, so I want to look at this story, it's in Luke 23 verse 32, this will come up on the screen behind me, and it says this, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, and maybe in your Bible it says the place called Golgotha, right? Golgotha simply means hill of skulls or skull mountain. They crucified him there along with the criminals. One on his right, I'm going to do it your way, one on his right and one on his left. One on his right and one on his left. Picture this for him. In fact, don't picture it. I'll put a picture on the screen. The scene that we've maybe seen before. Where's Jesus? In the middle. It's got that sign above his head that says Inri. Inri pretty much stands for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Uh, one on the left, one on the right. Okay, this is the image that we see. Jesus hangs in the middle. And isn't this apropos for where we are in society today? People are asking us, it's demanded of us, pick one side or the other. If you're for this side, you're against this side. And if you're for this side, you're against this side. But where's Jesus hanging? In the middle. Because he wasn't about earthly business. He was about kingdom business. He was about kingdom business. And any time someone tried to make Jesus choose a side, he'd bring it back to the kingdom. I'll just point it out, Jesus hung in the middle. In Jesus, 
in his last hours alive on earth, God Almighty chose to put him in proximity to two really messed up people. Think about this for a minute. Jesus, even in his death, was sent on a missions trip, was sent as an evangelist to reach two more. Two more. And so why is this important? God wants us to see that Jesus is there in all of the tough moments of our lives. These two men are just hanging on to the last bit of breath in their lungs, and Jesus is there. Have you ever felt yourself just hanging on, that there's moments in your life where you don't know if you can make it through? And we have this story today to know that Jesus is hanging in there with you. Now, we don't know a whole lot about these criminals. We don't know their story. And honestly, Family Church doesn't know about your story. We don't really know about your life and what you've been through. Today, you might just be barely hanging on to your marriage. You might be barely hanging on to your health. You might be just hanging on financially. You might be fighting for your happiness and fighting for your joy. The only thing we know about these two men is that they're thieves. We don't know what they stole or what the value of what they stole was. In this time, in Roman law, it was a no-tolerance place. These men could have been caught stealing bread to feed their families and got the death sentence. That's how strict it was. I want to take a look today, the next few minutes that we have left together, I want to look at the location of the crucifixion. Why here? Why Golgotha? Why Skull Mountain? It was imperative that they had the proper location for capital punishment in that time. They wanted to do it in very public places and next to roads that were highly visible. Normally they would do this sort of thing next to a heavily traveled road. We would call it a highway or an expressway. It was a road in which people would travel from their home to the grocery store or to the marketplace, and it was traveled heavily so that when people went by, they would look up and see these, these men hanging, and they would shake their heads, and they'd say, I don't know what these guys did, but I want to make sure that nothing like that ever happens to me. And it was a very real way of keeping people behaved. Watch this. In Luke 23, 35, the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. And so the people here were people just going along in life, and they'd look up and they'd see these people up on the hill, and so they'd stop and they'd make fun of them or whatever, judge them for their sin, for their wrongdoings, and then move along. The criminal, one of the criminals hanging next to Jesus, he jumps on that same bandwagon of insults and put-downs, and he looks over and says, yeah, if you are God, then do something. This man, in the last moments of his life, instead of hanging on to his breaths to elongate his life, he chooses to use his last breaths to emotionally hurt someone else. Think about that for a minute. Maybe you've been there before. Maybe you've been hurt or wounded about a situation and you use your words to hurt somebody else. There's no doubt in my mind that this gentleman was deeply wounded somewhere along the road of his life. His pain led him to, to despair, 
Despair led him to a criminal life. And his final words and his final deeds are slanderous words toward the only person who could save him. Hurting people hurt people. We're seeing it all over social media right now. Somebody says a hurtful statement. Somebody posts something that we don't, someone doesn't like. And so we have to make a comment. And that comment hurts somebody's feelings. And so now that they're upset, they have to comment back. And now we have these arguments going that is going to solve nothing. They are going to go nowhere. I'm going to help somebody's marriage today. We get into these kind of arguments in our marriages. You say something to me that hurts my feelings, or you raise your voice, so I have to yell back. And then you yell back, so I have to yell back. And I have to match you where you are. And, and, and there's no resolution. It's just one person trying to win the argument. And so we say more and more hurtful words till finally one person shuts down and walks away. What did it solve? We're going to get into the same bed in just a few hours and then not talk to each other and not do what married people are supposed to do in bed because we're mad at each other. I said something before uh, first service, we're going to get in the same bed and someone's like, well, maybe not. I'm telling you right now, I paid for that bed. <laughs> I'm sleeping in that. I'm sleeping in that bed. Dog on it. I'm just going to go here two, two more seconds, help somebody. The Bible says, do not let the sun set on your wrath. Don't let the sun go down still angry at your spouse. You made that contract with them. Work it out. Talk it out. Talk it out. Stay up till 5 in the morning. Talk it out. Don't go to bed angry because then you're going to wake up angry. And then your next day is all ruined because you're still mad about whatever. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Hurtful words hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. And then the cycle never ends. Let me just say, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy using his words to hurt somebody. This guy chose to angrily insult Jesus when he could have used his energy to simply breathe. You see, crucifixion was done in such a way that it would collapse your lungs under the weight of your, pre- of your body. So you would have to stand up on the nail in the feet just to catch your breath. So this guy is having to stand up on that nail and inflict more pain just to yell at Jesus. Imagine the amount of pain that he's in, not only physically, but emotionally. Some of us in here today and some of us watching online know what it's like. We understand what it's like to hurt that much. No, you may not be on a cross, but you have felt hatred towards someone. You have felt hatred towards someone. You've seen a post online and you just got enraged. Huh? Okay. It's funny, G- this guy is looking over at Jesus, and, and, and this is how it always is, right? When, when we're in pain, you don't know what I'm going through! And Jesus is kind of like, uh, I kind of do. I kind of know exactly what you're going through. Wounding others becomes this defense mechanism. And we think that if I just scream at you and get my emotions out, then I'll remain safe. And that's what this criminal is trying to do, but there's no end to that. So in contrast, there's a guy on the other side of Jesus. There's a guy on the other side. And guess what he's doing? One guy's insulting Jesus. Guess what this guy's doing? Well, let's look at it. Luke 23, verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked the first criminal. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing. One man's attacking, 
one man's defending. And I would love to have been here. I, I really wouldn't want to see Jesus go through any pain, but I would have loved to have been there just to see the rest of the conversation. We can look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We can piece together that there was more that was said, but we don't know the full conversation. I wonder how it went back and forth. But what we do understand is that this second thief, he understands the gravity of his situation. He understands where he finds himself. He, he understands he's going to die. That he's going to slip into eternity. And I just wonder today, does the church at large understand the gravity of the situation that we find ourselves in the world today? Never in the history of the church has it been shut down. Never. Since church started, it had never been shut down. Like, do we understand the gravity of the times that we are in? And so, I'm totally making this part of the story up. This is not in the Bible, but I like to write my own Bible stories. I wonder how this guy knew what he knew. I wonder if he snuck in when Jesus was feeding the 5,000. Maybe as Jesus is feeding the 5,000, word gets out, yo, they're handing out free tacos at Taco Bell. Get down here real quick. And I wonder if this guy, like, like ran up and, and got some fish and bread, free fish and bread, as Jesus is feeding the 5,000, and he's only there for the fish and bread. But he hears the preaching of a man. Maybe he was raised in a home that people believed in God and they prayed, but it was never his thing. We don't know any of this guy's backstory. The only thing we know is that he understood that he was with God. He was with God. And his final words are recorded in Luke 23, 42. Then he said, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And some manuscripts even have this at the end of that sentence. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom with your kingly power. It's a nine-word prayer. And what I've learned over the years is... The shorter the prayer, the more the faith. I listen to people pray. People pray for certain things in their lives, and they think that they need to do a three-hour long prayer. And what I've noticed is, most of the time during that prayer, you're trying to convince yourself and convince God that this prayer is going to work. The most, most faith-filled prayer I've ever heard is one word. Help! Teach, taught my son to swim this summer. And I told him, Bobby, if you're ever in the pool and you're too tired to swim, just scream help at the top of your lungs. And then, of course, he has to cry wolf and try it out and see if I'm going to jump in when he can really still swim. You know, you know how kids are, right? But that, that, that's, that's the thing, that's the cry that, that I know. If he screams help, I'm there. Your heavenly Father knows, man, if you scream help. Here's something deep that I want you to consider today. That nine-word prayer, because he's talking to God, right? And talking to God is prayer. That nine-word prayer is probably the first prayer he's ever prayed in his life. It's probably the first prayer he's ever prayed in his life. And it was a prayer unto salvation. And it was a prayer that gave him eternal life. It was the most important prayer of his life. And it was the only one he ever prayed. And it was something like this. Jesus, remember me. What we know about this prayer is that it shows a clear view in his heart of who Jesus is 
and what Jesus was capable of doing. He, who he is, Lord, Jesus, Messiah, remember me when you enter your kingdom. You can bring me into eternal life. And isn't this really the heart's cry of our generation today? Jesus, remember me? Remember me? Before I was the lead pastor, I was the youth pastor here at church. And I get Facebook messages all the time from teenagers who are now in their 20s and getting married and have kids and all that kind of stuff. And they'll say, hey, Pastor Mike, my name is so-and-so. I don't know if you remember me. And what does everyone love to hear when they say something like that? I remember you. I remember you. Oh, yeah. You're the kid who caused all the problems and graffiti the back of the church. I remember you. <laughs> Jesus, remember me? Remember me? Do you? Like, I'm going through some really hard stuff. Do you remember me? Do you, do you remember I'm still hanging on? Do you remember me from Sunday school? When I memorized 66 books of the Bible and we did sword drills? Remember me? I'm still in church. Do you remember me? When you're going through your finances and the income doesn't match the bills, like, Jesus, do you remember me? Do, do you remember that you wrote in the Bible? Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That if I were to give, that you'd open the windows of heaven, part of blessing that I won't have room to receive. Do you remember me? A thief on the left and a thief on the right. And Jesus is in the middle because he's called to reach both of them. Jesus met these guys exactly where they were. He met these guys exactly where they were. One does not accept Jesus. One welcomes him with open arms. Jesus looks over to the one thief and he says to him, I remember you. I remember you. I remember you when I designed the earth. I remember you before the foundation of the earth that I would meet you in this moment of time. And I would walk through the door of your invitation. I remember you. And Jesus says to him in Luke 23, 43, Today you will be with me in paradise. I remember you. I want to look at this location. Golgotha. The skull. Hill of the skull. And historians and theologians agree that this hill would be what we consider today a landfill. A landfill, a garbage dump. Has anybody ever been to a landfill before? I remember as a kid going down to the Goshen Landfill. It's back when you used to drive up on top of all the trash. You don't do that anymore there. You throw stuff in dumpsters, but... I remember my dad, we had this pickup truck, it was full of trash, and I was excited to be with my dad, man. We were going on an adventure, we were going to go to the garbage dump, and I'm like, yeah, this is going to be so much fun. And, and we take the truck, and rah, rah, we're going over all this trash, and we're going right up on the top of the mountain, up on the hill of all this trash. And they've got these, like, excavators, like, pushing all the trash and, and burying it. And I get out of the truck, and this smell... I can still, my mind can still smell it right now. The smell overwhelmed me so badly, I threw up right there. Oh, like all the joy of going to the dump was gone at this rotten, vomitous smell that went into my nostrils, piles of garbage and rotten mess everywhere. Golgotha? 
was worse than that. I'm sorry to be graphic this morning, but I need to be historically correct for you to understand the importance of where Jesus is at. For a family member to be sentenced to a death on the cross meant that your family was shamed. They literally would blot your name out of the family tree. It is as if you did not exist to your family. So nobody would be there at your crucifixion to claim your body once you died. You were not being taken off the cross by your family and put in the family plot. You're, you're gone to them. So they would peel the bodies off the cross and throw them into a landfill right there on this hill. Why is it worse than a landfill? Because it was a human fill. It was bodies. Could you imagine what that smell must have been like? Could you imagine the kind of wild animals that would sneak in at night to feed? No burial, no costly funeral services, no plot, no, no coffin, no casket, no headstone. It was the worst garbage dump imaginable. And that's where Jesus is witnessing. That's where Jesus was sent to reach two more. If you've ever thought your life was too bad for God, if you've ever thought your history was too bad, if you've ever thought that your behavior has been too bad for God, he went into a landfill to reach two more. Jesus is hanging with two criminals because God wants you to know today he's crying out that if you would put your faith in him you will be with me in paradise he screams this to the guy today you will be with me in paradise and in that moment in that moment when Jesus breathes those words Jesus lifts himself up and he breathes these words today you will be with me in paradise. In that moment, a landfill becomes Lord-filled. In a single sentence, Jesus brings paradise to a garbage dump. Paradise is now connected to a dump, and the connection is Jesus. Listen, you may be living in a garbage dump today, Someone online, you may be living in an emotional garbage dump today. You may be living in a spiritual garbage dump today. But paradise is searching for you. The Bible says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father forever making intercession for us. That his eyes are always scanning to and fro, looking. He's searching for you. You might find yourself in a tough spot today. But let me tell you this. Jesus is hanging in there with you. There's hope. There's hope. Maybe you know a person, and you would say, man, that person's life is a total mess. You might just be looking at the next miracle. It's so easy. It's so easy to look at someone else's decisions in someone else's life and say, oh, man, look at them. They're a total wreck. They might be a total miracle. Come on. So Pastor Mike, how do I begin this same journey? How do I step into this new life with Jesus? We got to look at this man. This man who says, Lord, remember me. It starts with a heart of faith that's willing to pray a simple prayer. A heart of faith willing to pray a simple prayer. Jesus, remember me. And that prayer only requires one breath. One breath. One breath. In a moment of time where our fight and our conversations are about breath. We're even having to cover our breath. It takes 
one breath, Jesus, remember me. It's enough to change eternity. God placed these two criminals in proximity to Jesus because God wanted to let us know today that we don't need to be great to get to heaven. We don't need to be great to get to heaven. We get to heaven through a simple prayer. Maybe you're watching online today or you're in the room and you're like, man, Pastor Mike, like, we're all family here. Why are you going to do a salvation call? Because it's been three months since I did one. Better believe I'm going to do one today. Huh? Maybe you've seen yourself lately lashing out at people, blaming others for the situations that you find yourself in in your life. And you're realizing, I need a little bit more of Jesus. I need to invite Jesus into my story, and I need to be living this story that he wrote for me. Would you just say today, Jesus, remember me. Remember me. I want to pray with you today. And as we pray today, at one point I'm going to ask you, just to say that out loud at your seat, Jesus, remember. Father, we thank you today that we're back to church. That we're gathering together in the house of the Lord. We thank you that we can get to see our brothers and sisters of faith once again and worship together. Lord, today I pray that we would remember why we are here. Because you remembered us. You remembered us. So today, Lord, right at our seats, right uh, while we're watching online, or maybe someone's watching this later on, we say to you, Jesus, remember me. Remember me. And I know, I can hear in my spirit that voice from heaven saying, I remember you. I remember you. You, that little kid who was running around church pews as a kid, caused all that trouble. I remember you. You're that kid that got caught smoking behind the school. (laughs) I remember you. I remember the day that I sat down with Father God, designed your life out, your beginning to your end. I remember you. I remember the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. I remember you. I remember the great things that you're going to do with those hands. I remember you. I remember the time that I was there and you didn't know I was there. I remember the time that you thought you had run away from me and that you, you thought that you got away from the calling I placed on your life. I was there. I remember you. Feel it in your spirit today. He's never forgotten you. He's never forgotten your story. He's never forgotten your path. He's never forgotten your plan. Because I remember you. Lord, today we thank you that we would leave here full of joy, knowing that you are with us, that you are for us, that you are on our side. I thank you that faith continues to rise in our hearts, that we are strengthened by the word of God today, that we were blessed coming in, we'll be blessed going out, everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name, amen, amen, we love you, have a great weekend.